Our guest on This is America and the World is Ambassador Dirk Wouters, who currently serves as Ambassador of the Kingdom of Belgium to the United States. The Ambassador formerly served as Belgium's permanent representative to the European Union, Chief of Staff for Belgium's Minister of Foreign Affairs, and as Diplomatic Advisor to the Prime Minister of Belgium. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, tell the folks three things that we should know about Belgium. Well, if I can start with uh, geography and a bit of history and a bit on the people, these are the three things I would like to say. First, on the geography, uh, we are centrally located in Europe. Well, sometimes we say Western Europe. Um, and so we, that means that we have uh, uh, neighbors uh, and our big neighbors, most of them, like Germany, France, on the other side of the channel, we have the UK, and then Luxembourg and the Netherlands, the two smaller or medium-sized countries. Historically, uh, the country, at least that was the idea, was meant to become a buffer between the great European powers, but which hasn't preven prevented great powers to wage war on our territory, two great wars, the First and the Second World War, for which we remain of course, forever grateful to the United States that they came to, um, to rescue us in a certain way and, uh, and liberate us um, from, the from the occupation. And third, about the people, uh, maybe I, could tell, uh, I can tell the audience that um, uh, they're living in an open society with an open economy, not too strong nationalist feelings, and the absence of strong national feelings makes that uh, they are rather tolerant people, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, speaking different languages, uh, French, uh, Flemish and, and German, and uh, uh, not uh, pushing too much uh, their own identity, except when we play soccer, of course, in the World <laughs> Champs. Uh, that's a nice overview you've mm -hmm. given us. Um, in my reading, uh, it, it seems to me when uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about the country, pretty much for the first time in a way, uh, kind of a liberal country, wouldn't you say? Uh, as far as, and I was thinking of uh, everything from uh, euthanasia, same-sex marriage, um, a liberal stance in a number of different directions, huh? Yeah, it, 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 liberal has a different meanings, and it has different meanings, of course, uh -huh. uh, in the United States and in, and, and in Europe. But as far as, as Belgium in, is concerned, I would, um, I would certainly like to mention uh, two uh, important decisions that were made with great insight, I think, strategic insight, after the Second World War by the political class. The first is to build uh, a first-class education system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you have a lot of testimonials from our American friends, expats in uh, Belgium, mainly in Brussels, and they will testify to the fact that the education system, the schools, the universities are really good ones. And the second strategic decision uh, was the, to uh, establish what we call a good social security and health system. Mm -hmm. And the health system uh, I don't know if you want to call it liberal, if you establish a health system that is uh, accessible, affordable, and with free choice. Uh -huh. But I would like to highlight these two decisions, if you uh, mention the word liberal, okay. uh, in the context, let's say, of the history of the country. Uh, can you say progressive, huh? Progressive, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I am uh, I am delightfully concerned to learn about the governance of the uh, country because different regions, different languages, uh, and in some ways there's a federal government, and in some ways there's a regional government. Help me understand that. Who who uh, we got Flanders, uh, we got uh, Wallonia. Is that the correct pronunciation? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit how that works. I'm confused. Well, it's a multi-layer governance system. I mean, uh, which is uh, not untypical uh, in Europe, where you have 
let's say, to start with a local level, and then in many countries you have a regional level, mm -hmm. a national level, and then a European level before you get to the international level. So uh, in, in my country, uh, we have had, after the Second World War, uh, six reforms of our liberal constitution of uh -huh. 1830, and they all went into the direction of giving more powers uh, to the different regions, which you mentioned correctly, they are Flanders, uh, 6.3 million people. So you have Brussels, Brussels region, which is a bit more than 1 million uh, people. And then in Wallonia, in the, in the south, you have 3.6 million people also. So in total, it's around 11.3 million people trying to live together. There's also a royal family with a king mm -hmm. and a queen. And as you said, different languages, but people are rather tolerant uh, uh, in terms of uh, speaking language with each other. I should also mention, uh -huh. uh, sometimes forgotten, uh -huh. that we have a, a small German-speaking community yes. uh, in, in the, the east of the, of the country. Uh, they have probably the strongest sense of belonging to the Belgian nation, mm. uh, whereas maybe in the other parts of the country, the Flemish, uh, Walloon, and a bit in Brussels, there's a stronger desire to... Um, have their own governance model, take their own decisions. But eventually, the idea is to work together and to come to a consensus at the national level. But I'm fascinated, uh, Mr. Ambassador, that <clears throat> Flanders in the north, yeah. essentially uh, Flemish, Dutch speaking, yeah. right? And then in the south, we have French speaking, in Wallonia, mm -hmm. and then this little sliver, and then in Belgium, it's kind of a mixed bag, but mainly French. But I gather that in the educational systems, in the media, in the health systems, that in th those languages predominate, and then on the national level, more the economy, foreign policy. Do I have it correctly? I think you have it correctly. I mean, everybody's allowed to speak his mother tongue. Let me say to the folks at home, uh, <clears throat> we're speaking with the ambassador from the Kingdom of Belgium to the United States. His Excellency's name is Dirk. Is it Wouters? Is that correct? It is Wouters. That's Wouters. how uh, at school they pronounce my name. But if after three times in the coming 20 minutes, we still say Wouters, we can switch to Wouters. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to go with Wouters, OK? Uh, sit tight. We'll be back on the other side. Uh, this is America and the World. This is America and the World is brought to you by Whittle School and Studios, the U.S. China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Julia Chang Block, President, the League of Arab States, the Republic of Haiti. The Rotondaro Family Trust, Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology, sharing tomorrow. The Forerunner Foundation, dedicated to forward thinking, public policy. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, when we're talking about governance, where does the king fit into all of this? And then there is a prime minister as well, huh? Yes, the king is the head of state. Mm -hmm. Like you have a president of the United States, we have a king. Like, so the country is a monarchy. Uh, it is, uh, and the prime minister is the head of the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the king has mainly uh, a ceremonial function, but he's also the head of the armed forces, like in other mon monarchies in Europe. The, let's say the, the decisions, the governmental decisions are taken by the government, and the, which is uh, chaired by, the, by a prime minister. Does the king appoint the ministers uh, of, in various uh, uh, areas of, of governance? He has no, uh, like in other constitutions in Europe, 
he has no uh, real veto power uh, against the nomination of ministers. Ah. It's, it's uh, political party driven, I would say, mm. the choice of the ministers, the choice of the prime minister. Is the king well respected? Is he well liked? Absolutely. By the, by the, uh, yeah. by the citizens yeah, and all? It's working well. Yeah. Ah. Tell me a little bit about the economy of, of the country. Uh, what, what drives the economy? What are the exports? What are the imports? Who are the trading partners? Yes, the trading partners in the first place are the neighboring countries and uh, the single market, but also the, the most important uh, trading partner outside the single European market is the United States. Oh, yeah. For us, a very important economic partnership. Now, the economy itself, um, I would... It, it is not, it's in principle one economy in Belgium, like it is in principle in the United States, one eco economy. Uh, at the same time, you have a lot of regional differences. And I would describe the Flemish economy in Flanders more like the German economy. I mean, they produce very many different things in very many different sectors. Mm -hmm. The Brussels economy is more a service economy. Hmm. And the economy in the south mm -hmm. used to be very much industrial, is moving to post-industrial, uh, and is depending on very critical sectors like pharmaceutical sector, for example. Mm -hmm. Big employment in the south of the country, pharmaceutical sector. Uh, the, up, up north is a bit more successful, huh? It is, I would say, more dynamic, yes, uh -huh. and uh, uh, less unemployment, I mean, it's almost full employment. You can compare it with the German economy. Antwerp so. is, is there, isn't it? With yeah. a major port, huh? Yeah. Seaport. Yeah, Antwerp, well, it's in, uh, in Flanders. In, 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 in the north, it's my home city. Is it? Uh, and uh, it is, I would say, if you would like to really understand where the economic heart is, is beaten in, in Belgium, uh, I would strongly recommend to visit the port of Antwerp because when you visit the port of Antwerp, you can see that the heart, the economic hearts and the economic lungs of Belgium hmm. are in that part of the country ah. with uh, huge connections to, uh, to this strong German economy as well. Yeah. And it is, uh, of course, an important entry point, uh, one of the most important entry points into Europe. Wow. and into the European market. What does it mean uh, for the country to be the home of both the European Union and NATO? Well, it means certainly uh, additional responsibilities to host these important uh, international organizations. Um, you know, the number of summits that these organizations are, have a tendency to organize. I mean, it's quite... Uh, so the host country has always extra responsibility. On the, on the other hand, it, um, it, it allows us to, to take a view on uh, the European integration project and on the transatlantic alliance, which is without any doubt a view of strong support. Mm -hmm and uh, also a view of trying to make it work as best as, it, as best as possible. So injecting also a sense of let's work together, let's compromise, uh, although maybe that's not a word that everybody wants to hear, but let's compromise uh, because that's, that's how we're going to be successful mm -hmm. and, uh, and to create the maximum win-win situations. We learn it from our own history, mm, mm -hmm. uh, from the history of Europe, and that's what uh, would say the the input also of the country into these two organizations. Uh, so, uh, what do you think is the uh, future of the EU? EU, and I ask that question mm. predicated on. Uh, uh, Remarks that uh, President Trump made mm. after the uh, G7 mm. summit in Canada. And uh, it almost seems like uh, uh, there's a big gulf now between the United States and the EU. And the question on the table is the future of the EU. What do you think? Yeah, it's absolutely a question on the table. And uh, there are a number of 
objective factors as well as the more international contexts that uh, plead in favour of a number of decisions that the European Union has to, to be taking on its future. Despite the existing divisions, there is, for example, a strong division today between East and West Europe on the question of migration, and there is a bit of a division between the North and the South on the future of the Eurozone. I mean, mm -hmm. the group of countries that is organized around the single currency. But despite these divisions, it is uh, the fact that now, as you mentioned, uh, the US administration has started to rule out America first uh, policy with some stronger uh, pressure on European countries regarding defense spending mm -hmm. and uh, some more unilateral actions of withdrawing uh, from international agreements, the yeah, climate... The trade is and right, and the on, trade. Trade is and right the, on the table and now, the trade. and tariffs. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so that is certainly one factor that will encourage the thinking in Europe in favour of more, I think, strategic autonomy for Europe. Do you think that President Trump's remarks may have brought the countries, the major countries of the EU closer together? I think, I think it has an impact uh, because there is some pressure on the European countries and when there is pressure, you try to stick together mm -hmm. in a club such as the European Union. But it's not just what is happening in the United States. It's also the fact, for example, that unfortunately the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union mm -hmm. and we will have to learn to live and to adjust uh, in a club without this very important uh, uh, country. Uh, and there are other factors. I mean, in, in Russia, uh, it is clear that, uh, at least uh, in the European eyes, that uh, Putin's uh, government uh, continues to be very active in Ukraine and not in an always a very pleasant way, that uh, they have become active in the Middle East in a certain way, and that uh, uh, they started to meddle in the internal process of our Western democracies. And, mm. and, and something else, Ambassador, some of the countries in uh, the European Union are moving uh, more toward uh, populism, uh, mm. much more toward, uh, toward the right, uh, and on top of that, uh, immigration has thrown a huge uh, wrench into the governance of some countries and some of the citizens of those countries, huh? I mean, it's. Do you, can you uh, take all of that in and, and tilt back and say, we're living in a whole different kind of world now, huh? Yeah, I mean, the world is, the world is certainly changing. Uh, and probably we were a bit too naive or too optimistic some years ago about the future of our, our world. Uh, we, we may have thought that it was moving in to, towards the direction of more and more and more international cooperation and more and more acceptance of the what we call the liberal order in the world, which we created together, United States and, 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 and the West. But that's not happening, huh? But that is not happening. I think there are... Uh, so we're moving towards something different. What do you think that difference is? What, 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 what label would you put on that? I would say... Uh, different uh, poles of power. So United States, then some new countries on the world stage, China and Russia, mm -hmm. but uh, they were also trying to be more assertive in their way uh, without necessarily cooperating. And then Europe also going for more strategic autonomy, but without wanting to uh, break the transatlantic link, because at the end of the day, and I speak a lot to young people at universities in Europe, and at the end of the day, when it comes to partner with other companies, be it in economics, be it on foreign policy, be it on education, be it on people-to-people -people contact, the European youth, they still prefer to partner with the American friends. I have no doubt about this. With American friends? 
But uh, do you see the world becoming more each country out for itself or self-interest rather than the shared values and friendship that have been enjoyed for the past, what, 75 years or so? Yeah, I think uh, you, have, you may have a point there that we are moving in, uh, as far as the international relations are concerned, into a period that um, where the relations become a bit more a bit less civilized and more rough and more self-interest. I think you have a point there. Uh, we still hope in Europe that the values will remain. We will, we will stick to the values, um, to the liberal values. And as long as there's no better system than the one uh, uh -huh. on which we prospered and we tried to keep the peace in the world, I think that to a certain extent we will try to defend it, but knowing that there is now much more competition mm. between, for example, democracy and autocracy, strong leaders, yep. leaders who want to cooperate in the multilateral world like it was before, and, uh, and probably also more economic, um, economic self-assertiveness. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, China is a good example of that. Let me, uh, we're at, uh, coming up on the end of our time, Ambassador, I want to ask you two questions that I think are important that I get in here. Uh, and uh, just give me a, a brief answer, if you would. Uh, what are the challenges that are faced in Belgium, number one? Mm -hmm. And how do you see your role as ambassador here in the United States? Well, the challenges in Belgium, I would say, remain very much to look after the uh, concerns of the of the people, which are, remain in great part uh, economic challenge. I mean, people want to have a good life. Mm -hmm. They want to have a good salary. And there has been a bit of suffering from the economic and financial crisis. I remember when I was working for the prime minister, we calculated that after the 2008 crisis, the, um, the Belgians could lose up, up to 25% of their purchasing power mm. because 25% was more or less the potential loss of the value of the economy. So there's still this underlying concern uh, that we have to regain sufficient economic strength, which is happening now. The mood is much better. The sun is shining a bit more. Second uh, challenge is certainly security. That is something new in the country. Yeah. Terrorism. And terrorism, we uh, never thought that it would happen to us and so there is now a better more realistic and updated sense of security the importance of the military the importance of working together on intelligence mm -hmm. the importance of organizing oneself at the local community level mm -hmm. to detect radic radicalization so that's the second uh, challenge the third is migration although I think the migration question has been very well handled in the country. A lot of solidarity between North and South, national plan to distribute refugees, and, uh, and, and the government has been overall generous. And, and went, but it's still, the migration uh, continues to pose a question of identity. People, uh, what will be our identity in 10, 20, 30 years' time? Uh -huh if we have too many migrants. And so, and the fourth question we discussed it is the, 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 the future of Europe. Now, uh, my role in the United States is the classical role of an ambassador. It's of course an honor to serve here uh, in the United States, but the main concern is to defend the economic interests of my country, mm. uh, because the economic corridor between the United States and Belgium is extremely strong. It's a bit an, uh, an untold story. If I, if I tell that a country the size of Maryland, which is the size of Belgium, is the 10th foreign investor in, in the United States, providing on a permanent basis 160,000 jobs, mm -hmm. that there are 1,000 companies, more than 1,000 companies, American companies in Belgium, also creating a lot of jobs, that 
the trade, I I'm, I'm, do not want to go into the figures, but the trade balance of the United States with Belgium is a positive one, which is rather exceptional. <laughs> the president will be pleased. Uh, he will be pleased. He probably is because we told him so. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Ambassador, we're out of time. I'm sorry. No, no, no. This is delightful. Thank you for the education. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. For information about This is America and the World and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our Ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This is America and the World is brought to you by Whittle School and Studios. The U.S. China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States. The Republic of Haiti. The Rotondaro Family Trust. Japan, history, hospitality, and advanced technology, sharing tomorrow. The Forerunner Foundation, dedicated to forward-thinking public policy. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Mm -hmm.